Good morning. Thank you for being here and a very warm welcome to you. We're truly honored and privileged to have you here with us today. Uh, we'd like to start the Youth and Truth conversation with actually a conversation we had right outside a couple of minutes ago. And um, that would be that in the past couple of years, we've seen that change is coming in multiple forms, be it um, in education, be it in the job opportunities, be it in culture. Earlier, it would take about 20 to 30 years for us to realize and see this change. But today, it's happening at a much faster rate. How would you suggest, or how do you think we as the youth should adapt to change like this and be prepared for it? Well, uh, <clears throat> I know I'm in a university. Uh, so, what I speak is not against it, but this is something as you said, change is coming much faster. So particularly educational institutions, whether it's school or college or universities, because largely till now, education has been a way of constructing a mindset. Depending upon where you study, everybody develops a certain kind of mindset. A set mind is a disaster. Maybe it is set for a particular purpose and it may serve that purpose. As you said, people are thinking education means employment. Education is not about employment. Employment is about survival. Education is about enhancement of the human being. A time is coming where this will shift in the direction I'm speaking very shortly probably, depending upon the speed of technological evolution, the speed of change in education has to happen. Well, all of you everywhere, is, everywhere these days are talking about uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence. I must tell you, my first experience <laughs> of uh, knowing that machines can do something like this. I was thirteen years of age. It's not like today's thirteen-year-old who's got uh, already discarded three different, uh, you know, models of cell phone or iPad and things like that. At the age of thirteen, for the first time, I saw a flatbed calculator, okay? Those days, uh, there were only two companies making it, at least there were the only two available in India, was Sony and Panasonic. Sony considered very expensive because it was hundred and twenty-five rupees, that means one point nine dollars. Panasonic, you could bargain it down to ninety rupees. <laughs> so everybody bought Panasonic. So somebody brought this to school and they just did tuk 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 into tuk 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 tuk. <laughs> I said, the, immediately my first thought was, why the hell are they torturing me in the math class? <laughs> Here there's a solution. <laughs> And immediately my mind went into, why don't they have a machine like this for science and physics and chemistry and history and all the nonsense that they're torturing me with every day. After nearly fifty years or more, now that dream is becoming real. In the next ten years, children can see there is a machine which knows more history, more physics, more chemistry than your professors and teachers. This is a great time. Because till now, in the name of education, we've been deceiving ourselves and everybody that memory is intelligence. This is not just in the university, it's gone in the name of religion, it's gone in the name of scholarship, it's gone in the name of various things. Essentially all this means is somebody got to read a book a few years ahead of you and suddenly he is a superhuman being. This will die soon and I'm very glad because now human intelligence will become valuable. Now human consciousness will become very valuable. How you are becomes more valuable than what you stacked up in your head. Because a small chip will know more than... You know, your phone can do ten PhDs a day. Yes? Because that much can be stored. So we are mistaking memory to be knowing or intelligence. 
So a time is coming where human intelligence will be of greatest significance, not memory. So education has to transform itself in this direction. So what this means is, we are moving from mindsets to consciousness. Consciousness means it's not a fixed thing. It is not just flexible, it has no shape and form. That's where human beings need to go, educational institutions to take that step first, because for probably last three hundred years we've been busy manufacturing mindsets. For example, because we're talking about India here, I think. <laughs> In India, still largely the education was designed by uh, Her Majesty's service. More East India Company, I would say. This education was designed in such a way where the cornerstone of education is obedience, not intelligence. I want you to get this straight. Obedience is the cornerstone of education process. If obedience is the cornerstone of education, this is a recipe for slavery. This is the trick of an occupying force. But we are still continuing that form of education for variety of reasons, whatever reasons. So, the change is compulsory. Change is not an option. Those who don't change will fall on the wayside. Will we allow change to happen in a haphazard way, torturing people, leaving a lot of people out of it? Or will we do it in a planned, focused way and we execute change? Will we execute change by design or by default? This is a big question in front of us. I hope as a generation of people, we have the sense to execute change by design, not by default. Thank you. I'm sorry, did I say something wrong? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I tend to follow on the same thing that you mentioned that the education system needs to be changed to adapt um, in the sense that… Why are you copying a question? <laughs> I, I'm not. It's not. Uh, it's… Uh, <laughs> I'm taking reference though, but I take a note. So, on the same note that education system needs to be changed um, and uh, it's more to say that learning and adapting, it's anyone's life's integral part. You need to adapt with how it's happening around you. Um, also, Charlie Munger said that human, need, human being needs to be a lifelong learning machine. You need to learn every day, every set of your way. But you have mentioned that people or human... Can I disagree with that learning business? You can. <laughs> you can. That's a view. It's more capitalistic view that you need to be keep on learning and adapting what you surround with. See, because your learning is establishing a mindset, now you struggle to adapt. I am not interested in learning. I don't want people to learn. I want people to become in such a way that they're perceptive, that they can see things as they are. Not because of their learning, simply because human faculty has the capacity to absorb a situation as it is if you don't have a fixed mindset. If you see things as they are, according to intelligence and competence, you will respond. Why should you adapt? You just need to respond. This is the significance of being human, that we are the only creatures on this planet who have the necessary faculty to be conscious and to be able to respond, not to react instinctively. So this whole process is an ancient mindset of we have to learn so much, what we have learned becomes irrelevant after fifty years, so we have to relearn and adapt. But that, as she said, is going to happen every two and a half years now. What used to happen in once in fifty years is going to happen every two to three years now. So when it happens every two, three years, you establish a mindset, you learn something, you establish a mindset, then you try to adapt to the next thing, you'll go crazy by the time you're fifty. But if you keep your intelligence uncluttered and perceptive, you will know how to respond. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one of the questions that uh, keeps popping up in everyone's mind is uh, how, do you, how do you define the clarity of purpose in your life? Uh, and that's something that you've probably been asked multiple times before, but this is something that we still struggle with. Uh, 
and we easily get influenced by people around us and get distracted from what we truly are passionate about. How do you recommend today's youth to be focusing on building uh, uh, true passion and also uh, developing a clarity of purpose in life? Oh. See, uh, this idea that a human being has a purpose to his existence is a very tyrannical idea. The moment you have a strong sense of purpose, you are a natural tyrant. The question is only a question of competence. There are lots of tyrants all over the place. There are lots of Mussolini's and Adolf Hitler's all over the place. Fortunately, they're important and incapable. <laughs> yes, there are lots of them. Don't think only one was born. There are lots of them. Fortunately, nobody has the capacity or the competence that those tyrants had. Otherwise, there are a whole lot of people with same intention of wanting you to be something other than who you are right now. <laughs> so if I have a purpose to life, if it gets organized, it becomes a mission. Who the hell are you to have your own mission? You're here, you're just a pop-up on this planet, all right? You pop up and you pop out. Here, instead of doing what is needed most right now, for maximum number of people, you have your own purpose, maybe God-given purpose. Whenever people say they have a God-given purpose, they have done the most terrible things on the planet. No, you don't like it, it's okay, but have they not? Whenever people said, God spoke to me, terrible things are coming. <laughs> you can be sure about it. You… you heard these statements because you are trying to endorse your nonsense with some other authority from elsewhere. Why do you need a purpose? Life is a phenomena beyond your understanding. You're here to experience it and enhance it for yourself and everything else around you. That's about it. What is there for you to have a purpose of your own when you've not even figured out where it begins, where it ends? When you have not even figured out where this cosmos begins, where it ends, where you come from and where the hell you will go, how come you have a purpose of your own? You don't need a purpose, you just need sense. You need sense and sensitivity. And sensitivity will naturally come if you look at life as a more inclusive process. Right now some studies in the last two days creating a flutter, I've been talking about it for the last twenty-five years. Some studies say that uh, in the next five years the insect population is going to go down so dramatically that all agriculture on the planet could be seriously hit and food could become a great crisis. I've been talking about this continuously for the last twenty-five years. People think worms and insects are no good. But I'm telling you once again, if all the worms die right now, in the next fourteen to eighteen months, there will not be a single life on this planet, including you and me. If all the insects die, within the next two and a half to four years, not a single piece of life will exist on this planet. But if you and me die, planet will flourish <laughs> Yes, this is the fact of our existence or no? Hello? Whatever nonsense we think about ourselves, without human race, this planet will do great. But without worms, insects, microbes and various other creatures, this planet cannot exist as a life. So, our idea the most destructive idea that's been put into human minds in the name of religion, philosophy and nonsense is that creation is human-centric. Creation is not human-centric. You are just a speck in this creation, you're really nothing. As I said, you're like, you know, on your computer screen there are pop-ups. You pop up and you pop out. <laughs> you think so much about yourself. But actually before you and me came here, countless number of people who all thought they are great people came and went, where are they now? All topsoil. Yes or no? Worms are feasting on them, all right? But human beings, <laughs> this is all it is. In this vast cosmos, this entire solar system is a tiny speck. In that tiny speck, this planet Earth is a micro speck. In that micro speck, uh, Detroit, city is a <laughs> super micro spec. In that you're a big man. <laughs> this is a serious problem. 
That is, this is all because of our learning, do you understand? This is because of our learning, because we've lost our sense of perception. We're not seeing things as they are, we're making up things in our mind in the name of education. It's time we come to reality, once machine learning comes, your nonsensical learning will not mean a damn thing. Just because you read a book, you're acting superior. No, a five-year-old kid will turn on his machine and tell you, here. <laughs> it's a great time <laughs> So our next question is more to do with um, as we graduate from school and leave university and go into the corporate world, um, a lot of people follow their passion and take an unconventional path. What do you path. mean? They get married, is it? <laughs> <laughs> they follow their passion and take an unconventional path. My question is, should you do what you love or should you love what you do? Uh, you should not love anything. The important thing is you're just loving, all right? If you're right now loving, if you see the flower, you will uh, handle it lovingly. If you see a man, woman or a child, you will behave lovingly. If you see a dog or a cat or even an insect, you will behave lovingly. Or if nobody is here, you will just look at everything lovingly. This is what is important for a human being. I love something is a vested interest in the world. They have caused immense damage in so many different ways. Well, out of this, many products fall out which... <laughs> I don't want to go into the detail now, but the simple thing is just this. See, follow my passion, I know it's become a very... what to say, a in thing to say everywhere, I follow my passion. Your passion is destructive, I'm telling you, the important thing is, once you are enabled by education especially, if you have… if you feel education has been an empowerment in your life, you must look around, peel your eyes without any prejudice and see what is most needed and do that damn thing. If all this comes because you are trying to extract some sense of joy and satisfaction from the world, you have not understood that Human experience essentially comes from within, whether joy or misery, peace or turmoil, agony or ecstasy, no matter what it is, human experience comes from within you. Is that so? Hello? Hello? It looks like I'm asking for a higher opinion <laughs> Human experience, no matter what, Madness or frustration or love or joy, everything comes from within you, isn't it? You are trying to create an inner experience by managing the world. This is why all the disasters are happening. Why human beings are so insensitive to everything, why they are going about on a rampage. We call this development, we call this economy, we are on a rampage, all right? Why we are like this is, we are trying to extract an inner experience from an external man manipulation. No, this is the first thing you must settle before you step out of this university, you must settle this one thing, that your experience of life is created by you. Now naturally you will see what is the best thing I can do in the world. And that's what you should do, what is most needed right now. If you are an empowered human being, so much investment has been made on you in the name of school, university, education, all this stuff. When so much has been invested on you, you must see what is most needed right now. And of course, whether you have competence to do that specific activity or something else, that, that judgment is always there. But not the question of what… My passion means, I like to do this, I don't care whether it's needed or not, I just like to do this. This is a vested interest, isn't it? So just to follow up on that, <laughs> so, so as you said, the, the summary But if would, it's a local girl, it's okay, you can do the passion. <laughs> no, it's the summary of that will be that we people, we choose to learn those things that we think value in it, not those that transform them, correct? So how, how, how do you suggest that 
one can expand his or her horizon to see beyond that what's, <coughs> the, uh, what's her or his logic tells to do it and not to do it, basically. See, of course human beings will act according to their individual, individual intelligence. That is a given, isn't it? You cannot… you cannot do the same things that I do or I cannot do the same things that you do. This is the nature of life, this is the nature of human intelligence. But why is it that we are seeing the same situation differently? Is probably because we have evolved different types of mindsets. But if you don't have a set mind, that is your… your brain is not a concrete block, it is willing to take any form that's needed, then I believe if we look at this situation, both of us will see it as it is. If we see this situation, whatever the situation, as it is, we'll be seeing it the same way, isn't it? If you hold your opinion above your perception, then you will see it differently. If I hold my learning and my mindset above my perception of things or the reality of what is there, then I will see it differently. Then of course, we will fight. But that is what I am saying. Why are you approaching with a set mind? You are approaching with a set mind because you are giving too much significance the information that you have gathered. Information is not intelligence. It is human intelligence that is needed to transform situations. Information, what is very valuable today, to, tomorrow it may be trash, isn't it? Because you are talking about change. When things, situations change, the information that you have, which you thought is very valuable becomes trash or no? So, uh, following up on that question <laughs> So, in working towards uh, our ambitions, uh, we sometimes uh, for, forget to enjoy the present, uh, experience life as it is and uh, we strive towards making the beautiful future. Now, how, how do you recommend that we think about balancing the two, that is enjoying the present versus working towards the future? <laughs> See, there is no such thing as future. It's just a plan in your head. Such a thing doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. Is it so? Hello? It doesn't exist anywhere. In your experience, there's only what is here now. What is right now, here and now is all that is there in your experience. It's all that's ever been. So there are two very important faculties which are unique to human beings compared to every other creature on this planet. We have two faculties which are very unique to us which is a very vivid sense of memory. Because of this vivid sense of memory, we have a fantastic capability to imagine. If you did not have memory, would you be able to imagine? No. So right now, traveling from memory to imagination means you're traveling from past to future, completely bypassing your experience of life. Right now, what is it that human beings are suffering? The various levels of suffering people are going through. It even happens in the university, I know. <laughs> Those are really, you are in the most insulated atmosphere, even here people suffer immensely, I know that. See, they are not suffering life. They are essentially suffering their own memory and imagination. Hello? Because people can suffer, what happened ten years ago, they still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. <laughs> so is this life or is this suffering of memory and imagination? You are just suffering your memory and imagination. You haven't even touched life. This is the unfortunate consequence of learning that you don't know how to keep your memory in your memory chip and keep yourself free from that. You carry your scholarship on your head, this is what happens to you because you are living in memory. The whole value of your life is because of the memory that you carry, isn't it so? See, when you say, I'm educated, what does it mean? That means the whole value of your life is in just the memory that you carry. I'm telling you, in the next five years, this will be ridiculous. You must change before that. Those who change ahead of 
the times to come are the pioneers of the time, isn't it so? Those who cha change after changes happened are the leftovers. <laughs> Don't be a leftover, you must be ahead. The simple thing is just this, well, we acquire some knowledge about how to do this, how to do that, it's useful. You have lot of phone numbers on your phone? So at least now, there was a time when we… I used to remember at least around eight hundred numbers and names because I didn't have a phone book and there was no cell phone. Just by memory we used to remember. It was very valuable, very valuable. Now it's just trash, I don't even know my number anymore <laughs> Really, people ask me, Sadhguru, what's your number? I really don't know. Because it doesn't matter anymore, because the machine does the damn thing, isn't it? You don't have to remember your own number, it is all there. So I'm saying, you do not make yourself who you are because of what you remember. This means you are a creature of the ancient times. The ancient may mean two years ago or two thousand years ago, it doesn't matter. You belong to a place which is dead. You become part of the dead. Now future imagination and your expectations means you are trying to raise the dead. Don't try that. Shall I? You okay for a joke or...? Yeah, <laughs> They are becoming very serious, that's what I'm afraid of. The, the, first, the first consequence of scholarship is you become serious, not just serious, dead serious. <laughs> This happened, an old couple were watching an evangelical program on the television. The preacher was going full on and uh, he was promising he's going to heal them and all that stuff. So he… over the television he's going to heal them. He said, place your hands wherever you have problem in your body, I will heal right now. So the lady put her hand on her throat and sat because she had a thyroid issue. The man looked at her and then put his hands upon his groin and sat. <laughs> she looked at him and said, John, he only said he will heal the sick, he did not say he will raise the dead <laughs> So what you think is your future is just you're trying to raise the dead. From what you know, you're trying to create a future. Don't do that. Because future is the next step. The next step is available to you only if you take this step properly, isn't it so? Hello? Yeah. Do one thing, you skip this breath and take the next breath, let me see. <laughs> Try and see what will happen to you. This will be the last breath you will take, isn't it? <laughs> How can you take the next step without taking this step properly? It is the entertainment of the vain, to go on thinking what kind of future, what kind of future. No, how well you conduct the present, future is a consequence. This whole problem has happened to education systems, they've all become goal-oriented. I see particularly, I'm sorry, but particularly in management schools, they've become very goal-oriented. What goal-orientedness means is, uh, uh, your learned professor was saying, about his mother talking about a mango tree. See, you don't have to sit there and do mango meditation <laughs> for mangoes to come. You just handle the daily process of watering the mango, mango tree, manuring it, taking care of it. You never thought mango. Mango will anyway fall on your head, isn't it? It's a consequence. Instead of handling the process, you're trying to handle the consequence. We have a business event every November third week and over two hundred CEOs from across the world come to train for four days with us and all that. So they… last time when they were there, they were asking me, they're running major companies in the world, they're asking me, Sadhguru, we pick the best people in the world from the management schools when we identify that they're doing well in the first year, second year itself, we pick them. From IIMs, IITs, across the world, we s always resourcing them. And we constantly keep a, not just a bone, a meat hanging in front of them. In spite of that, 
our organizations don't run as smoothly as yours. And we know you're a slave driver, <laughs> that is, it is a volunteer organization, nobody's paid for the job, nobody's trained for the job, I get only dropouts. <laughs> so, <laughs> they said, how is it that everything is running like a seamlessly smooth machine out here? Not small operations, over nine million volunteers across the world, variety of activity happening. Ah, uh, nothing ever fails, it just goes on properly. How is this? I told them, see, this is all it is. Your problem is, you have set a goal. Your one eye is on the goal, so you have only one eye to find your way, very inefficient. Here I have inculcated in everybody, they are devoted to the process of what they're doing right now. They don't care, they don't even know where it'll go. They are just absolutely devoted to what they're doing right now. Well, somebody else is directing it, it will go where it has to go. If we don't do what we're doing right now really well, where I want to go is just hallucination, isn't it? So don't think this hallucination is a making of the future. If my blessing for all of you is, may your dreams not come true. <laughs> because what can you dream of right now? only exaggerating what you already know. Isn't it so? Hello? Can you dream of something that you do not know? Only what you already know, you exaggerate it a little bit and think, this is my dream. My blessing is let your dreams not come true. Let your life be about something that you could never dream of. So in speaking of this, how does one um, truly find their values and then eventually stick by their values or should they even be sticking by those values that they find throughout their life? Values meaning? It could be anything. It's things that you believe uh, to be true. <coughs> it could be guiding forces. It could be any of those. Morals. Could be. See, for me, my existence, I'm sorry, it looks like I'm contradicting everything. No, <laughs> I have no morality. I'm on camera, see? I have no morality. My integrity is a consequence of my humanity, not my morality. People who thought they are morally correct, they have done the most horrendous things on this planet, yes or no, please tell me. Because of you thinking what is correct, not just to somebody, even to your own children you've done terrible things. Yes, it is true. Parents, teachers, elders, priests, pundits, they have done terrible things to people simply because they think they have a moral righteousness, yes or no? Why is it? Morality has become important because you put your humanity to sleep. If your humanity is on, what does humanity mean? It's just this, do you know in your brain there is something called as a reptilian brain? It is the size of a… say your fist or maybe it's the size of a crocodile's brain, that kind of brain you have. And there is also cerebral cortex, which is what makes you human which is what gives you various sense of being something different from other creatures. What this humanity means is, these days probably you're not seeing this because dogs are all leashed, but if you leave the dogs around, you will see they will go about peeing all over the place. Not because he has some urinary issue, <laughs> he is building a pee kingdom <laughs> because his entire existence is about a boundary. Always he's thinking about his territory, his boundary. So those men and women who are operating from that part of their intelligence are always thinking of boundaries. But essentially to be human means you have moved to the other dimension of intelligence where it is always looking at how to break all the boundaries. Fundamentally you look at yourself and see, no matter where you are, you want to be something more. Isn't it so? Hello? 
If that something ha more happens right now, what? Something more. We can go on like this. So how much more do you believe will settle you for good? If I make you the king of this planet, will you be fulfilled? Don't look at me hopefully, I will not cause <laughs> I will not commit such a blunder <laughs> if, if you become the king of this planet, will you settle for good? No, you will look at the stars. You would want the solar system. You want… you want the galaxy, you want the Milky Way. Yes or no? Because there is something within you, this is only instilled in a human being, I want you to understand this. This is essentially a human quality that you want to expand limitlessly. Maybe right now you're approaching it in a constipated way, which is called as ambition. Ambition means you're approaching, you're longing to become limitless in a constipated manner. You know what's constipation? <laughs> it happens little by little <laughs> So this is what ambition is. Why do you have an ambition? You don't need it. What you need is an active dynamic intelligence and an active dynamic body which supports that and you have understood your experience of life is always created from within you. If you know and you are creating the nature of your experience, would you keep it miserable or blissful? What's your choice for yourself? No, what you want for a neighbor may be debatable. What <laughs> What you want for yourself is hundred percent clear, you want it to be in the highest level of pleasantness, yes or no? Yes. For yourself. So if you are joyful right now and you're alert and dynamic in your intelligence and active in your body, what will you do? What will you do? You'll work for some silly idea in your head or will you work for something that's absolutely needed because you will perceive life as it is right now, you may call it ambition, you may call it passion, you may call it desire, all you're trying to do is squeeze a little bit of juice out of this planet. That's all. You're trying to somehow find some satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, love from the world. I'm telling you, please pay enough attention to yourself and see, if you want joy, if you want fulfillment, if you want peace, if you want love, if you want ecstasy, it can only happen from within you. Yes or no? Yes. If this one thing you settle, world, each one of us will deal with it to the best of our ability, but this is the fundamental ability of the human being, that we long to breach all boundaries. If you are some other creature, always you want to set up boundaries. If you sit here and if you have no sense of boundary of this is my friend, this is my enemy, this is a stranger, this is an unknown person, this is my family, if you do not have such things, if you looked at everybody in an inclusive way because your boundary is not here, it's limitless or no boundary. If you looked at these people and acted according to your intelligence, would you do something wonderful? Hello? This is your humanity. Your humanity is not… cannot be caged. Your animal nature can be caged. We have evolved over a million years, but evolution still is by choice. You can either take a backward step or a forward step. If you take a forward step in your evolution right now, that you understand what this is longing for is to become limitless, not to become rich, not to become powerful, not to own something or something. You want to be limitless because these are the boundaries. So do you want to enhance it in increments? Do you want to go in installments towards the infinite expansion that naturally this life is seeking? You think in installments you can get to infinity? You think it's possible? No. No. So how do we do it? At least you must look at it. I don't want to go into that aspect right now, <laughs> but at least you must look at it because if you fulfill your ambition, your life will not be fulfilled. Only because you take a lifetime to fulfill it, it is so. Whatever your ambition is, suppose by today me, uh, evening I will manifest it for you, will you live with total fulfillment for the rest of your life? What you want in next fifty years, I will have it done for you by today evening. Will you live joyfully, peacefully, absolute fulfillment, will you do it for me? No. no. So it's not going to work anyway. So only thing is, only if you fail, it works. <laughs> so
the wrong way to wire yourself. Only if a simple thing that you want takes fifty years to get there, then it works. But if it happens tomorrow morning, you... it'll be a disaster, isn't it? So now you're talking about change at a rapid pace. So what you... Uh, your ambition is, if it looks silly tomorrow morning, what do you do? You already invested in that direction, you can't change. So it's best, you don't have an ambition, you don't have a passion for anything, but you're capable of doing everything passionately. Whatever is needed, you're capable of doing it joyfully and passionately. That's what makes a human being who he or she is. Sadhguru, let's take on that. <laughs>So let me ask you that, I'll be the simple person, I don't, I don't want any passion in my life, I don't want no, any... No, no, no. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> take, off the, take off the simple, because I'm saying having an ambition and passion is simplistic. I am not talking about you becoming a simple person, in fact you become a limitless human being because you have not fixed anything for yourself. If you are joyful, have you noticed this by yourself? On a certain day when you're very happy, are you willing to do more things? Or on a certain day when you're a little depressed, are you willing to do more things? Please tell me. So lot of idiots on the planet are going about spreading, Oh, if I am happy right here, I will not do anything. Well, your experience clearly tells you only when you're happy, you're willing to do whatever is needed, isn't it? You're willing to bend backwards, even to reach out to somebody on the street. But when you're a little miserable, <laughs> you are nasty to everything around you, not willing to do anything, you would like to just lie down and sleep, isn't it so? So where does this thing come from, that if I am joyful and I'm in a very dynamic state of intelligence and physicality, that I will become a simple person? No. <laughs> the, question, the question has to be asked um, that, Okay, uh, I, I don't have to have passion at this moment or any ambition. I just want to live my life at my fullest. Um, full on happiness, joyful, and I just want to live at the fullest of my potential. How can I do it? What's the step will be? You're getting to the point <laughs> See, uh, most fundamental thing that needs to change in our understanding of this is, when you say full-on experience of life, first thing is to understand that experience of life, no matter what is the experience of pleasantness or unpleasantness or agony or ecstasy, only happens from within us, isn't it? So, if you take charge of this, this is what is creating it's an experience creating machine. Yeah. Everything you look at it, oh you love this person, you hate this person, you're angry with this person, you like this person, you dislike this person, everything is happening from within you, isn't it? Do you know that people who you think you cannot stand, somebody thinks he is the most wonderful person? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> so, this experience is created from within you, no matter what is the nature of your experience. If you take charge, take charge of this one thing, that your experience is determined by you and nobody else but you. If this one thing happens, then don't worry, rest will happen. To what extent? To the extent, to the fullest extent possible that our intelligence, our capability and the times in which we exist, this is very important. People think they are doing everything by themselves, no. The times in which we exist is important. Depending upon… the time should allow us, right? Suppose you came here a thousand years ago and uh, you talk about artificial intelligence, they would bury you. <laughs> yes or no? So it is a times, so t the times should be conducive that it allows us. With all this, in your life, if you do not do what you cannot do, it's not an issue. But in your life, if you do not do what you can do, you're a disaster, isn't it? I am only talking about avoiding this disaster 
because most people have become this disaster, because they have their own passion, their own ambition, their own mission and their own moods going up and down, all kinds of things. If you did not have all these things, you would do everything you can do, isn't it? In your life this must… this much must happen, everything that you can do must happen. What you cannot do anyway doesn't happen, what to do? Uh, so, uh, changing topics a little bit, uh, since this auditorium is full of Indian expats, so one of the questions that we want to, uh, wanted to ask is, how do you recommend that we, uh, the Indian youth here in the US, uh, start thinking about uh, contributing back to India while they are living their American dream? Uh, because these two pursuits are very diverse and they might, might not coincide. These two nations that you are mentioning, in many ways, uh, in culture, in geography, in economics, are at two different spheres altogether. One is a new nation, hardly two hundred years old, little more than two hundred years. Existence of United States of America, maybe two hundred years old since independence, but really it is only hundred years or hundred twenty years where really in a focused way they started building this nation. When you talk about India, for us uh, recent times means five thousand years. <laughs> in India people in their conversations they say, you know what happened recently in our history? They're talking about two, three thousand years <laughs> So these are completely two different ways of looking at it. There is immense value to both, immense. Because of the newness of their existence, the American people, I'm not talking today, when they came here and they trying to figure out in a new land what to do, they did whatever was needed for their given situation for them to go on where individual aspiration was the main thing. Nobody thought of a nation when they came here. They were only thinking of their own ranch or whatever they call it, a piece of land. They thought they have broken away from the nation of being England or Scotland or Ireland or maybe even Germany and France and wherever they came from. But largely these three uh, nations probably to begin with, they really thought they have broken away from the bondage of nationhood. That's what the debate is still going on about the right to bear arms, because people did not think they are going to make one more nation which is so tight like England of that time. They thought they're just going to live here free. But slowly, for practical reasons, one understands without organization, Individual enterprise slowly will work against each other. If we don't have a war, we will have a family feud. <laughs> family feuds in this country were like wars, isn't it? It went on and on for generations because it is the same thing. Somewhere you have to fix the boundary. Still human beings have not come to a place where in this world we can simply live without a boundary. We've not come to that place. At least those who claim they're educated, at least in your minds and hearts, you must remove the boundaries. Geographically still there are boundaries, we cannot remove those boundaries. If you suddenly remove those boundaries, there will be a total upheaval of things. So having said that, India as a land is like running into thousands of years which gives people a sense of timeless existence. Where our way of doing things have always been, never about individual aspiration, simply what is inclusive and happening because always we remember, you know, in, in many Indian homes, <laughs> this is very hard for American people to understand, in Indian homes, many of them have kept records of sixty, seventy generations of people, their names, my grandfather's name, uh, sixty generations ago, seventy generations ago, they got names written down in the books. <laughs> so their sense of existence is very different, which is changing dramatically now. 
As a part of this Youth and Truth, uh, I've been going to all these universities. Recently, when I was in Delhi f uh, five days ago, they were asking me, Sadhguru, f uh, when you were a youth, how things were the… what were you thinking? And today, how the youth are, what do you think is the difference? I said, one stark difference I see is, we were always thinking of a revolution. How to change this country, how to do this, how to do that. Today you go into the university, everybody is only talking about individual aspiration. Nobody is talking about the larger context of what it is. This is a consequence of a certain level of economic development. When it was… the country was at a certain status of development, when I say certain status of development, in 1947 when the British left India, the average life expectancy of an Indian was twenty-eight years. Today, it is sixty-nine point seven years or nearly seventy years. This is a huge change. When average life expectancy was twenty-eight years, naturally we were thinking revolution, how to change this? Something needs to happen dramatic, otherwise it's not going to change. But today, the present youth are thinking of individual aspiration. So people look at this as, oh, is this not a bad thing? I said, no, it's a very good thing. Because if all individuals in a country are doing well, the damn country is doing well, isn't it? Hello? So these are two different approaches. What America thought of individual enterprise and, uh, you know, individual aspiration, probably in fifties and sixties post-World War II, now India is beginning to think in early twenty-first century. This is a natural consequence. This is one thing. <laughs> this is one thing which will be troublesome for nations which develop in a big way without individual aspirations being accommodated. So nations which developed in a rapidly, in a short span of time, using a stick. Stick works very well when people are poor. The moment they do well, if you use a stick, they will turn back and bite you. Yes, this is the nature of a human being. When he is desperate, he understands a stick will drive all of us in one direction and something will happen. If you all scramble in one direction, something good will happen to me also. But once that scramble is over, then I'm thinking of my own individual aspiration, now the trouble comes. That trouble is coming wherever development happened too rapidly because of a forceful way of doing things. This is the good thing about India. Uh, Professor Krishnan said that it's a chaos. Well, it is a chaos only for an external view, viewer who doesn't understand our existence we would be fully… you know, we would get thoroughly bored with too much order. We like that. Uh, we're driving on the street, suddenly an elephant comes. <laughs> really, we like that. <laughs> if suppose an elephant came on an American interstate, oh, the whole nation will scream, how can this happen, an elephant came on the street? We are very excited, we'll pull out our cell phones, take pictures and share with everybody. I saw an elephant on the road today, all right? So it's a… see, there are two kinds of orders. You can have a manicured garden and it looks like spick and span, everything is the way you want it. And you can have a forest where nothing seems to be in order. But if you take away your hand off the manicured garden for just three months, it will be nonsense. But forest, for million years it's existed, obviously it's a better order. <laughs> it is just that, to live in the forest, you need different kinds of skills. <laughs> yes. Well, once in a way you get eaten by a tiger, but you travel all the way to Africa or India to see a, uh, a lion or a tiger. So when you got eaten, you definitely… you did not enjoy the light, uh, wildlife, but you saw it for sure. <laughs>
Thank you. We'd now um, like to open it up to audience questions. So uh, we have a couple of people with mics moving around. If you could just raise your hand and they will come right up to you. Hope I'm not too abrasive for the university. <laughs> so. <laughs> Who's speaking? Okay. You need a microphone. That's a microphone? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a grand marketing idea, but not technologically not good to do that. Sadhguru, <laughs> namaskaram. My question uh, is about India. India currently is a shining star on the global map, economy is thriving, people are flourishing, all things are great and going good. Uh, with, and in the last four and a half years, we have seen a decisive, serious government which is taking us in this development path. But my question is about this gruesome, you know, horrible act that happened yesterday at Kashmir. And we saw 40 plus Jawans killed. So I don't know how, what's the psyche of these people who can get into a car with 300 kgs of ammunition and, you know, just blast. My, my question is, how can government do decisively, uh, you know, to, to solve this at the bud? And the second part to it is, I know it happens periodically, but the psyche of these people, how can this be changed? Can we ever imagine inner engineering in Pakistan or POK can, without being killed? You know, without being, having the fear of being killed. You leave the question then, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my question, the two aspects of it, the government aspect and the people aspect. Thank you. <clears throat> See, um, as I said earlier, we're still not in that level of human consciousness where all boundaries and borders can be just wiped out and human beings just embrace each other and live, there's no such love affair going on. <laughs> Still, uh, national identities, religious identities, various other kinds of ideological identities set us against each other. It is… Uh, it is as simple as it is, but when it comes as to how it manifests on the ground, it's too complex. It's not something you can solve like that. So, in the making of a nation, in the making of a nation, one important thing is the sovereignty of the nation. Because nation exists only because of its borders. This may be an unpopular thing to say in the United States right now, but... Uh, <laughs> but you call something a nation, only the first and foremost is the geographical border, isn't it? Well, people can go this way, that way, people can change their language, people can change their religion, people can change their beliefs and ideologies, but it's the geography which is the first dimension of making of a nation. So this sovereignty should not have been dragged for so long after independence. It's a serious mistake. It should have been settled immediately. But unfortunately, they did not settle it for… I mean, I don't want to make a… Uh, political post-mortem now, but it's a serious mistake not to settle the sovereignty of the nation, not to fix the boundaries and say, this is it. Still, it is a line of control. It's not the national borders, it is still a line of control which is always out of control. And uh, there are various things, I don't want to give a political commentary now. So you're asking about the mindset. The mindset is like this. This has been in many ways put across. They are fighting for what they believe in. You are trying to fight for what you believe in. And this will go on endlessly, you understand? Either you must change your belief system or they must change their belief system. And that doesn't look like in your future, <laughs> all right? That doesn't look like that. But 
either you must have the wisdom to end the enmity. You must kill the enmity, you must have that wisdom. If there is no room for that wisdom, unfortunately, it will naturally translate into killing the enemy. It will naturally go there. Whether you like… Uh, am I propounding this? No. It will naturally get there, whether you like it or you don't like it. So just because somebody lives across the border, do you want to kill them? Definitely not. But at the same time, do you want to protect what you see as this nation? This is an unfortunate dilemma of being human. If you were an animal, anybody crosses your bound, b boundary, enters your territory, you just kill him, all right? Hello? Yep. But this is the dilemma of being human. Somebody crosses your boundary, you… you may have to kill him, but you don't really want to kill him. This is the struggle of being human. This struggle must be there in a human being always. If this struggle goes away, you will become an animal. This struggle must exist within us, but still acting decisively for the larger well-being of a nation has to happen. Why I'm talking about a nation is for me, nation is not a political entity, nation is not my nationalism, I, I don't belong to that. For me, nation is the largest amount of population you can address right now. If you want to bring well-being, you cannot address the globe. Hello? Yes. You cannot address the whole globe just like that. It is not within your means to address the globe. The best thing you can address right now, the largest human entity you can address right now is nation. If you go down, maybe there are states, maybe there are religions, maybe there are castes and creeds and all kinds, don't go there. Address the nation because it's the largest segment of humanity you can address right now. In that context, sovereignty of the nation becomes of prime importance. Well, what has to be done has to be done, but we must have pain in our heart. Even when we cause damage to somebody who is a threat to us, we must have some pain in our heart, otherwise we will lose our humanity <clears throat> So I'm just saying, when retaliatory action happens, don't do this. We must… unfortunate, it must be done, but we must have some pain that we have to do these things. Vanakam Sadhguru, Hi, I'm Rashmi, um, I'm from Chennai. Now, I um, have, have practiced Shambhavi Mahamudra since I was fifteen. Um, thank you for it and… Who, who is serving you idli and sambar here, huh? <laughs> My mom is in here, I'm missing her. <laughs> So, uh, my question to you is, um, since I've come here, I had to explain my, uh, my way of upbringing, my culture or the way I do certain things. And um, you have said Adi Yogi is not light, he's darkness. This darkness is something that is associated with evil in certain cultures. I'm a dark person, so you're saying I'm evil? <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but I'm not calling you evil. I understood what you said when you said Adi Yogi was darkness, uh, he was not light. But when I'm explaining it to my friend or to anyone for whatsoever, how do I put it in a context that they understand? Because like you said, there are cultural differences. And how do I put it in a proper context? Can I… is it okay for me? Can I take the liberty of referring to you also as a little bit dark like me? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> okay. So you're a dark girl, all right? Now that you're a dark girl, you make yourself so wonderful, so wonderful that people will start saying, oh, dark girls are wonderful. That's the only thing you should do in the world. Don't say, no, this color is good, that color is good, this is nonsense. Make yourself so wonderful, people see, oh, dark-skinned people are fantastic. <laughs> if you… if you try to do your Chennai in Detroit, that's not fair. No, I'm not m mentioning fair as a complexion <laughs> Not fair <laughs> because it is 
it's important that your culture and your way of doing things is as important as anything, but it's very important when you come to a new land, you don't try to impose that, you only keep it as a, uh, you know, we have a flower pot. But all the seats are occupied by human beings. But if we keep flower pots on all the seats, that will be meaningless, isn't it? So you must keep your culture like a flower pot, alive, always, colorful, alive, Chennai, all right <laughs> but, <laughs> but don't try to make everybody do the Chennai stuff, this is Detroit <laughs> all right. So, it is… isn't it fantastic that people who lived in different parts of the world are so different? Just imagine if everybody was same, you would want to go to another planet. <laughs> isn't it so fantastic? From one place to another, they're so different. See, this is the uniqueness of India. If anybody, very different kind of people come, Indians get very excited, <laughs> different. But in most other cultures, something very different means they become defensive. This must change. You must be excited about the difference, not fearful about the difference. The fear about the difference comes from the crocodile brain in your head. The excitement about everything different comes from being human. And about you trying to sell darkness, See, light has become very valuable simply because of the way our visual apparatus are made. Suppose you were an owl, no, I'm not saying that, suppose, because in South India, being an owl is not considered wise, it's considered stupid, okay? So suppose you were an owl, your value would be darkness, isn't it so? Hello? because that's how your visual apparatus are. Right now, what you know as light, let's differentiate between what is light and what you know as light. What you know as, as light will… can only happen if something is burning. Is that so? Coal is burning, petroleum is burning, nuclear energy is burning or the sun is burning. Something has to burn, only then the kind of light that you understand through your visual apparatus can exist. Anything that burns will not burn forever, is that so? It has to get exhausted somewhere. If you set up a lamp or a candle here, it may burn for two hours. This bulb may have whatever twenty thousand hours they're talking. <laughs> You may have hundred years, the sun may have hundred billion years, but everything that burns will burn out sometime, isn't it so? So what doesn't burn is always cool and dark, you and me, huh? <laughs> so what doesn't burn is always cool and dark, there's an eternal character to that. So out of this wisdom, we said in yoga, when we talk about the divine to a beginner, we refer to the divine as light, divine light. Once one advances in their experience of life, we refer to the divine as darkness. Because only darkness can be unlimited, borderless and infinite. Light as you know it can only happen in a momentary way. It flashes up and it goes down. So light as you know it is a very temporary and momentary happening in terms of existence. What you think is sun in human experience, because our life is just a few years, we think it's a limitless source of light. But in the nature of the existence, in the nature of this cosmos, sun is just a momentary happening. It just flashes up for a little bit of time and dies out. But the larger part of creation is largely dark, isn't it? Lightless, because it's eternal and always. So, it's good.
We have time for one last question. Oh, oh, sir. <laughs> My name is Amritya and I have a question… Can you speak a little louder? I have a question for you. Yes, um, sir. My question is, why do people lie all the time? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's not that people lie all the time. You may be just in some bad company right now <laughs> Now, uh, for yourself, leave the other people. For yourself, you're a little boy. Oh, I'm sorry, you're a big boy <laughs> You must understand this. Don't concern yourself about what is truth, what is a lie. Just concern yourself about this one thing. Every word I utter, every action that I take in my life, is it for everybody's well-being or is it just about me? That's all. Don't worry about what is true, what is lie, these are all endless nonsensical debates. Just concern yourself about this, whether everything that you do is inclusive or exclusive. If you just fix this one thing for yourself, then you don't have to worry about anything else, about am I correct, wrong, am I right, wrong, am I sinning or in virtue, am I telling a lie, am I telling the truth, this is not the point. The point is your existence, your action, your word, everything, is it inclusive or exclusive? Just fix that one thing. Thank you so much for taking the time out to be at the Michigan India conference here with us. It was truly an honor to have you and I'm sure all of us will leave with a different light and having thought about everything that you've said. Thank you very much. Thank you Sadhguru for Thank such you. an engaging and inspiring conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long time since I came to Michigan. Thank you for having me here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.